Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. I am Steven. And I'm Daniel. And today we have an exciting detour from the first 500 year series because we are joined by the great, the magnanimous Eric Ybarra, uh, who probably needs no introduction, but heck, I'll do it anyway. And I'm going to read off of a screen because, Eric, you tell your story better than I do. So Eric is a revert to the Catholic faith from Protestantism, spent over a decade studying the doctrinal nature of the divisions that exist within Christendom, uh, particularly between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, but also is interested in uh, the differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. He's a speaker, and he's appeared on uh, a billion social media outlets. Um, he's most especially known for his contribution to the start of the Reason and Theology channel and his own, which is called Classical Christian Thought. And he resides in central Florida with his wife, Victoria, and their six, yes, I said it, six children, who I assume are now awesome. in bed. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well 11, 11 kids, right? Because you have five books that you have to live with. Also. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so well, Eric, Eric is the author of five different books, uh, a, a book on the rebaptism controversy in the early church, third century. A book on justification, uh, Melchizedek, uh, the Filioque, and the latest one on the papacy. <laughs> Eric, so congratulations yeah. on all that, Eric. Welcome to the uh, channel. Thank you man. for that introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, it's, I'm grateful for your kindness. Yeah, the kids are still awake actually, um, because they're uh, usually we don't clean on Sundays, but uh, I think they're just ordering a couple of things in the kitchen. I can hear them talking and arguing. So, unfortunately, if you do hear something break... I am hearing. Please. Yeah, that's done. That's fantastic. Steve had to already go through the bed, bedtime routine, right? Yeah, mine are still up, too. They they decide, they always decide just before bed that it's time for, like, cereal. I don't know why. but uh, So they're, they're going for the Cheerios right now. Um, I thought that, you know, we watched Cinderella. We thought that would be it. They're going to close their eyes. No, it was cereal time right after. So that's, that's what I'm dealing with. Um... But yeah, okay, so great. Uh, Eric, it's really awesome to have you on. We wanted to have you on so many times, and then we had, like, it just wouldn't work out, all kinds of things back and forth. So sorry to actually our channel, too, uh, to our listeners, because uh, there was such a delay, uh, not only in our own episode, because we're sloppy, but also because it was just hard to get Eric on, because uh, we, we couldn't get our schedules to align. So it's awesome to finally have you uh, in person. Awesome. Awesome. So, um I will take the opportunity to uh, to mention that uh, my book, Prophets and Councils. You know, you should have had me do this. Maybe it would be more comfortable. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care what anybody thinks. So uh, Prophets and Councils, uh, my book on the rise and fall of the Montanist movement in the city of Carthage in the third century, is currently available on Amazon. And like I said, it just talks about um, the strength of the Montanist movement in the early third century in the writings of Tertullian. And then towards the end of his corpus, you can kind of tell that the movement had fallen out of favor with most, most of the North African churches. And so um, for scholars, it, for a long time, it's been kind of a question of like what happened and what is the story there? And most have kind of just left it to mystery. But um, in my book, I try to, to tackle that mystery and to, to actually give a narrative of, of what possibly happened. And I tie it to simultaneous developments in the Church of Rome um, and how the Church of Rome is conceiving of its own authority, its own Petrine authority. And that actually lays the groundwork really nicely for Eric Ybarra's book on rebaptism, I'm sure, <laughs> because um, what I argue in the book is that the, the Montanist movement had fully assimilated uh, into the Carthaginian churches by the time of St. Cyprian's Episcopate. So what you're seeing in Cyprian's Episcopate is kind of the effects of that assimilation, and that will in turn... Um, affect how the rebaptism controversies and the laxus versus rigorous controversies play out. So if you're into that topic, you're into any of those themes, uh, go by the, go by the book, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, Dan, it is St. Patrick's day. I'm wearing green. You're not so pinch pinch. Nope. Um, but I figured we would start this episode with, um, with, uh, the St. Patrick, uh, collect. Sure. Let's do it. <clears throat> Name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. O Almighty God, who in thy providence didst choose thy servant Patrick to be an apostle to the people of Ireland, to bring those who are wandering in darkness and error to the true light and knowledge of thee, grant us by his intercession so to walk in that light, that we may come at last to the light of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. 
Great. And it's it's good that we're starting with Patrick because all of us at some point have um, <clears throat> have an Anglican past, a uh, little detour into sure. Anglicanism, and St. Patrick, of course, is very important uh, for Anglicans. So, um, hey, great segue, by the way. We can start with uh, Eric Ybarra's story. So um, the goal of this episode for both Eric and for the, the viewers is really just to, you know, we've heard Eric – you know, in debates and talking about his research and scholarship and, and you know, Catholic versus Protestant, Catholic versus Orthodox. But um, it's always nice to get to know the person as well and sort of what the journey was, um, not only intellectually, but, you know, the movement of the heart. And so that's what we kind of want to do on the channel today. We want to focus, of course, on um, especially how encountering the patristic um, sources helped, you know, kind of push the needle towards Catholicism. So, um, Eric, why don't you kind of start us off with your story, and we'll kind of get out of the way. And, you know, how were you brought up? Was it a Christian home? Was it not? Um, why don't you start there? Yeah, yeah. And, and please uh, feel free to uh, stop me at any moment and take control of the conversation. Um, I've done this enough where I, I'm pretty fast. But I don't know how fast. <laughs> so, um... Oh, well, we're actually going to bed. I was just going to leave you on and... Um, so i was born in miami beach florida into a hispanic family uh my i actually never met my biological father Mm. um my lovely mother um she she left her house uh that is my grandparents uh Mm. when she was 17 to pursue a music career and she was a singer slash pianist and um she's originally from new york uh bronx new york but my family my grandparents uh they come from a cuban puerto rican background and before that spain Uh, in fact when uh when my ancestors moved from spain and uh, eventually got to the states they changed the name from i as an in indigo, B A R R A, to Y. So the American uh, citizenship uh, changed the last name from I to Y, uh, and why? they came. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> why? Why? Um, but uh, they ended up coming to the port of New York. They lived in the city. My grandfather lived in. Uh, Harlem, East Harlem, moved to Bronx. He upgraded from there to Bronx. So he came from a very poor, poor side of uh, New York City. My my mother was born in that in um, 1960s, actually late 1950s. And um, eventually uh, they went to Puerto Rico before they moved to New York. And uh, in Puerto Rico, my grand, my mother uh, went to high school there. And then moved to Miami and met my biological father and uh, I was born. Mm. But my mom was very young. She was always out on cruises, performing at restaurants and different venues. And so really, uh, my grandparents ended up raising me. Wow. Um, mm. So my, bio, my so yeah, my, my, my grandparents took, took over <clears throat> and uh, they went to church every single sunday and catholic so I, yeah they were catholic yep i was baptized into uh was baptized as a catholic no and uh it was a holy family north beach my uh, north north miami beach mm. and um received first communion saint patrick's cathedral right there on the coast uh and um but my catechesis was very weak though my grandparents were more cultural nominal Mm -hmm. uh catholic so adamant about going to mass uh but they we never talked about god at all in fact when we used to hear the doorbell ring and it was like jehovah's witnesses or mormons or possibly evangelicals my grandfather would open up the door and say we're atheists (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah that's one way to get rid of them (laughs) Um, so you know everybody, shh, 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 you know everybody quiet. <laughs> um, so by the time I uh, became thirteen years old, I started to uh, I started to read a lot of science fiction. I started to read philosophy, 
Um, I started getting into science. Um, biology and chemistry piqued my interest. And so I just started to frame my way of thinking by the authors who were influencing me. And, you know, one particular uh, author was influencing me was uh, Terry Goodkind. I don't know if you've heard of uh, him. He wrote a series called the Sword of Truth series. It's uh, Each one of those books is like 800 pages. And uh, it's a long series, about 13, 14 books. Wow. And Goodkind um, himself was an atheistic, altruist, Enrond kind of a guy. Mm. And so he, uh, he, he engineered the main epic character, Richard Rawl, as an atheist, an objectivist, an altruist. And everybody else who was kind of silly and foolish in the, in the book were religious folks. Mm. And mm. so that had an impact on me as I was becoming 13, 14, 15 years old. Sure. And so I'd still go to mass with my grandparents, but uh, I'd look at everybody, including the priest, and I would say, you know, these people, they think that their voices are penetrating through the roof of this building. Um, mm. And uh, they have all these details about what is so beyond us. It's, you know, I compared it to like grabbing stars on a six-foot ladder. And I just really started to doubt everything. And so my grandfather noticed that I'd be bringing books on philosophy and books on um, just evolution to mass mm. so he finally stopped knocking to on. mass yeah i bring it to mass because i i didn't know anything about the mass you gotta uh, you gotta keep yeah. in mind yeah. i didn't know anything yeah. about what was going on i knew i had the the mass memorized mm -hmm. but i didn't know anything about it so he stopped mm. knocking on my door on uh to to, to ask if i wanted to go to church because he kind of knew that um, I, I just don't have any more faith. So went to university uh, at uh, the University of Central Florida. And uh, I was on my own for the first time, so I was away from home. And I ran into a Baptist e evangelical preacher on the campus. One of these like... Charles... And you ran away saying, I'm atheist, I'm atheist. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, no, actually... Um, I moved, I moved into one of these dormitory situations where your roommate is a complete, it's, it's completely anonymous. You don't know who you're moving in with. Mm. Um, this is uh, academic village at UCF over here. And, uh, I moved in on a Sunday before semester started and I noticed my roommate wasn't there, but all his belongings were there. Mm. And as I was pulling in my bedspread and computer and desk and all that i noticed that my roommate who i had not met yet had a library up and every one of the books had something to do with the bible and christianity mm. so i was like wow this is going to be interesting mm -hmm. you know and um i he came home i uh, came to back to the dorm at like 10 30 on sunday night and i finally met him i said hey I, you know i'm your roommate we got acquainted and he says oh yeah i've been at church all day i'm like all day man you got home at 10 you got back at 10 30 yeah. it's like yeah we go we go um we do three hours at church then we have fellowship afterwards then we return to church have another sermon another prayer service then we fellowship more and then we leave <laughs> so, wow well uh so we started talking for six months and uh, he got me into Peter Kreeft. He got me into um, William Lane Craig, Gary Habermas, um, Josh McDowell. I mean, I read them all. Yeah. I just, everywhere mm -hmm. I went, everything that I didn't know about Christianity, theism, I it, it overtook me. Mm -hmm. I had my little iPad, uh, iPod. Um, anytime I go to the gym, I was listening to Kreeft, a debate uh, over, you know, the reliability of the Gospels with Craig Blomberg or something. Mm -hmm. And I was always yeah. carrying three or four books on apologetics for and against. And I, it, it just blew me away. And within six so months, there, go ahead. So there was never a moment 
where it, you were kind of militant in, in their, your unbelief, right? There was never like, oh, I'm not going to talk to this Baptist or, or was there a few weeks where like, yeah, I'm not going to engage no. with this or were you right away? Like, I want to engage. I'm intellectually, you know, involved in this. I loved it. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Mm-hmm. I was up till five in the morning sometimes with him uh, talking about these things. And that man today is, uh, he's a great Christian man. He's mm-hmm. married. He's got wonderful, beautiful kids. Um, I love him to death. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I was not hostile at all. I really just didn't mm-hmm. know anything about yeah. these things. I argued with Christians online on the forums, you know, like the old Yahoo certain forums. Sure. And, um, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I'd never met somebody who could actually, you know, articulate a defense the way, uh, mm-hmm. my friend did. And uh, so that's 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 what changed. That's me. an amazing thing. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. But Peter Kreef, we hear that a lot, even at Wheaton. Steve, remember, like a lot of a lot of uh, Protestant Christians were just just love Peter Kreef. Yeah, we knew it. we had a couple people in our cohort that that liked him too, and mm-hmm. and really drawing people in just into belief, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, the, I, within six months, I started going to his church, and um, he was at a, one of these Reformed Baptist churches. And, um, but they were, you know, looking back now, they were extremely different than the surrounding Baptist churches. Um, the pastor there was very committed to Donatist writings. So he, he, he kind of looked at the Reformed Baptists as having Donatist as part of the Trail of Tears. Um, Mm. and so he took church discipline extremely seriously. When you were baptized mm-hmm. into the community there, you subscribed by oath to live a certain way. And um, if you didn't, you were subject to discipline. And uh, I saw many public excommunications, something I'd never thought. North I'd Africa would love this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, and we, it was very militant, you know. So mm. he, he took a lot of us young guys under his wing. Um, took us through Bill Mounts' program, learning biblical Greek, um, learning Hebrew. We would stay up at the church with him, watching lectures from Master Seminary, different seminaries to get our educa- get our theolog- theology proper. Um, and eventually, they started to accredit our church uh, long distance wise. Oh wow! And uh, we would go out evangelizing um, weekly. Like Saturday morning, we would go knocking on doors. Saturday night, we would so go. You, you became the person at the door. <laughs> yeah, I was the person at the door. Yeah, um, and uh, um, we went preaching um, at clubs, um, in st- nightclubs, and you name it, man. We used to go to like the, you know, the women's clinics, the abortion clinics, and and mm. and and uh, pray. We used to hop on buses. And ask, ask the bus driver for the microphone so we could just present the way of the master. You know, hey, do you think you're a good person? <laughs> yeah. You know, that whole thing. Yeah. Um, you're an adulteress I, lying. <laughs> <laughs> so, so were you, so, okay. So let's, let's pause there for a second. Um, yeah. We'll stop on that bus for a second. Yeah. Now you're already then a Christian. So, so, so take us through like how you even came to the point where you took this seriously enough to say, I want to give my life to this. And did you get rebaptized? I did. I okay. did because uh, you, you, you got to, yeah, yeah, it was Donatist, right? <laughs> uh, they, they rebaptized themselves sometimes. Yeah. 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 Um, but, uh, my Catholic experience was, it was embedded into a worldly culture. You know, um, if, if, if we were going to Maria's Quince, we would see the priest there with on his six or seven shot, you know, yeah. um, the music, um, the, the, the South summit. I'm not saying all that's bad, but just my understanding of mass and, what we did as a culture and a family around Catholicism and Jesus Christ, uh, I had to wash all of that out and completely mm. empty my 
understanding to accept what I was getting afresh. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just simply took it as an axiom that what I was experiencing as a young man or as a young child in Catholicism was just a hijacking of the faith, yeah. you know, a complete hijack. So, yeah, that's, and I decided to give my life to Christ um, because I started to go to sleep with sweaty palms. I was worried about how I was going to answer my creator mm-hmm. if I died and I was going to meet him. Right. And mm-hmm. um, so out of fear, yeah. um, you know, I, after my classes, I'd go to the mm-hmm. university library, go up four flights of stairs, find a corner where nobody was at. And for hours, I'd read the Bible. And I read it over and over again. And that's when I started to listen to lectures on, you know, lectures on the Bible, lectures on history. And, and then it's funny because like, like, <laughs> actually my, my own, uh, just, uh, when you're saying that, when I was in um, undergrad, I would find this one corner of the building uh, in, C- in CLO, Dan. I, I would go find this one corner yeah. of the building. There's like a chair next to a window. And I, I swear, nobody even knows this hallway exists. I, it's like, it's probably just, <laughs> like after they built it, like no one knew it existed anymore. And I went and I sat in that chair like every day um, when I was going through my own like early stages. And I had the MacArthur Study Bible. <laughs> I yeah. was, I yeah. was reading. <laughs> and I, I to, dude, to this day though, one of the best studies, like personal, just one on one studies, like with the Bible that I ever did in Genesis was literally that. I was like just sitting there, just absorbing. I was like drawing out family trees and all this stuff through the MacArthur Study Bible. So it's just funny you say that, like the, the commonality of experience. Yeah. <laughs> guess, yeah, like, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I, I went to university, you know, um, I had been a maniac. In high school growing up, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, You know, they had me in like advanced classes. Um, I remember I I had like AP physics, AP calculus, all. And I just didn't do good at all at any of these classes. And um, but I scored high enough on the SAT to make it to university with a scholarship. And um, but I, I was. I, I had a I had a natural reformation before I went to university. Mm-hmm. I I started to um, study history and I gotten interested in military history. So I started to like sharpen myself up and uh, you know mm-hmm. get out of like the cockamania that I was in. Yeah. And um, but I was still living in sin, like you know, uh, deba- like I was still lewd and yeah. lascivious in in my life. So when I came to the Lord, it was a radical mm-hmm. turnaround. And yeah, they baptized me in a big lake. And, um, and you know, I, like I told you, they, they I got plugged in to a, a very radical community. Within years, I was up there at the pulpit. Um, mm-hmm. I, I used to have audio on Sermon Index, or not Sermon Index, but SermonAudio.com. I don't know if you remember that from back in the day. Protestants had like this go this this mecca for just <laughs> sermons, and um, I used to have material up there. Oh wow! Um, the the church has since removed everything. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, but uh, I had a you know I, I had a, a traumatic experience at this church, hmm. and um, you know actually um, I had gotten I had gotten married there. And um, the woman that I got married to there uh, was not a very mature Christian, and so and and so she ended up leaving me very soon, mm. um, within a few years. So when I uh, so when the, after that happened, okay, um, the church got into a very dark place. Mm. People were being excommunicated. We were excommunicating people for just very frivolous things. I remember one guy believed that it was a sin to wear high heels because of something he read in the Puritan paperbacks, and mm. it led to and a. He wore ex- high heels, or you're saying? <laughs> no, no, no. He 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 didn't wear high heels. He thought, he thought it was sinful for girls to yeah. wear high heels, um, and so. Uh, and and so the, the church underwent a lot of stress and 
Um, I ended up getting myself uh, into a situation where um, I lost sight of my the, the mortification of my life mm. and I fell out of discipline. And so I ended up being excommunicated from that church, mm. Baptist wow. church. And uh, when I left, I left in, in agreement. I was like, yeah, you guys are doing the right thing. I want to come back. But um, what they they require you to do is to go through one year of penance in order to prove that you can come back. And so I immediately started that process. Um, mm. But in that process, they were telling me things like, okay, we want you to meditate on the Psalms. We want you to listen to this. We want you to um, sing and chant. And we want you to go through a concordance on your sins and start writing reflections on your sins and I had one guy come into me once a week to look at my binders and you know so in other words I I, I was excommunicated but um, most of the people we excommunicated would just go down the street to another church yeah right yeah yeah but I really believe in the New Testament where you know it says that the church uses the keys mm -hmm. um, to, to bind you it's those very same keys that have to loose you. And that's that's how they taught their people there, you know? Right, right. So right. I immediately went into this one-year penance uh, schedule. But as I was doing that, um, I started to doubt that they were legitimate, mm -hmm. you see? And that's when I started parking at the local seminary, and I started to pull books off the shelf on early penitential discipline. Oh, wow. And I would just read volumes of old German scholars on the <laughs> what yeah, the early... yeah, pull the dust off the book. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was actually a reformed theological seminary, um, mm. part, one of the RTS campuses here. And uh, um, I started to learn that, yes, that the church I was going to had the right idea. When somebody does not show fruits of repentance mm -hmm. over a certain period of time, they are to be banned in some way, you know, um, and they should go through rigorous pain of, you know, refre reflection and uh, mm -hmm. fastings and, you know, different things. So I said, okay, so they're right on that. Because I tell you, when I left, when, when, when I left that church, uh, initially, when they asked me to leave, I contacted churches all over the country that I knew of, mm. um, even ones that were renowned in the Reformed Baptist Presbyterian Reformed community, uh, including um, an eminent church nearby us of a, of a Presbyterian scholar whose name I won't mention, but if I said it, everybody would know who it is. Um, and they were all telling me, don't worry about that discipline. What do you... Just, just come to another church. Yeah, you know we don't, need, we don't need to worry <laughs> yeah. about that. They're, it's a non-essential. They're legalistic, you know. But that's not what I was finding out when I. Yeah, was, you were convicted the other way. Yeah, I was convicted the other way. Yeah. You see, I started yeah. reading Eusebius. I was reading, um, I was reading some of the early apostolic constitutions on the stages of the kneelers, the hearers, those who were asking for praying. And I thought, oh, no, 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 the church, the church I'm going to has it right. But where they didn't have it right was what were they excommunicated from and what were they being restored to? Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. consistently mm -hmm. said to eat the flesh of God. Yeah, right. <laughs> and once I found that like a dog with a bone, that was it. Mm -hmm. I, I was I searched. This, I learned the sacramentology of the early church, the ecclesiology, the concept of authority, all of that stuff. So as happy as I was with the church for taking serious the New Testament injunctions on discipline, mm -hmm. um, I, I ended up departing ways yeah. because they, mm -hmm. they didn't have the right footing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, they were playing church the right. right way, but they were playing nonetheless. It, so is this a, so this is a independent like Baptist -y kind of church this isn't a denomination nothing like that they were they, they got credentials through a conservative Baptist association okay um, 
But yes, this was a guy who graduated from DTS, Dallas mm-hmm. Theological mm-hmm. Seminary, um, fully dispensationalized, right? And and heard a voice <laughs> to move to Florida and start churches. So yeah, it was very much practically independent. But no, there was a board. It, it was not authentic though, because any time the pastor did something that was questionable there was nobody we could contact mm. Mm. so it was independent um right interesting so yeah well, that's the far end of uh of penitential discipline on that side um but i guess <laughs> on on the other side we have say one our father and three hail marys but <laughs> so, right so you could imagine you know yeah. when i started yeah. to when i started to learn about all these things you know i sat down with lutherans and um and um, I ended up meeting a woman who today is my wife. Mm. Uh, in this process, I met her, and um, her and I initially wanted to go back to the Reformed Baptist Church, but we were both mutually studying this at the same time. Mm. And um, so we sat down with Lutherans, um, got great books. I started building libraries, you know, and <clears throat> I wouldn't do Presbyterianism. Um, I didn't see the consistency of it. So I was brought to the Canterbury Road. Yeah. <laughs> Frank E. Wilson, mm-hmm. Faith and Practice, um, <laughs> one of the one of the Anglo Catholic one of the Anglo Catholic yeah. uh, classics, um, and I found a little happy home in a very reverent APA Anglican church. Oh, APA. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Under- I mean, I see, see, it's like a, it's like the move for Protestants, right? It's it's if you're a low church Protestant, non denominational. Okay, you got your Bible down. You've read St. Paul already. You're all good to go. And you start reading the Church Fathers, and, and automatically right off the page is the sacramentalism, right? Yeah. You have to you have to deal with the Eucharist almost right away. And that, I mean, for anybody who hasn't dove into the Church Fathers, that's what you're going to find, and you're going to have to wrestle with that. So were you, were yeah. you, um, did you flirt at all with Luther, or were you kind of... I did, you know, even as a Baptist. So there's a lot, there's, there's a few different epic stories within my time at the Baptist church. Um, uh, give me at I, least I one, did. Eric. Just give me at least one. We're here. <laughs> We're here. Well, one of the things that I ended up doing very much to the dislike of the leadership at the Baptist church um, is I started to befriend um some of the more famous scholars in biblical uh, scholarship. So I started mm-hmm. developing conversations with N.T. Wright, Douglas Moo, um, at the time D.A. Carson, when he was doing his uh, editorial work against the new perspectives on Paul. Um, and so I was getting feedback from people who I thought were more qualified mm-hmm. than my pastor. And he really did not like it. Excommunicated. <laughs> well, I had a couple of close ones before the one that actually happened. Um, I did have a couple of close ones. I'll tell you this. I and this shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes, but I started to adjust my view on justification, mm-hmm. where I didn't see the active obedience of Jesus being imputed to us for justification. Boy, when I told that to one of the leaders, it went right to the pastor. I got a call in the shower the next morning. He told me I was going oh to hell. God. And he told me I needed to sit down with some experts and and to, to repent of my sin because the devil was speaking through one ear. He rent his garments. Wow. <laughs> like, what further need <laughs> if we have witnesses? And so, then, and so then you became the expert and wrote a book on justification. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's years later. That's years later. But uh, um, so I, I ended up, uh, we had some really good contacts um i ended up sitting down with uh one of the one of the foremost experts on puritan puritanism and mm. he tried when we met at a red lot you know we read at a uh, boston market it was and uh he gave me his lecture and told me the fears of uh what happens and people reject this doctrine anyway it, they were none of it was successful until they said you know what eric we got it we want you to contact the head of the new testament at such and such a seminary we all send our guys there we we know that their team there the faculty is a hundred percent faithful 
Just contact the head of the New Testament there and tell them your problem and have and and help ha, he'll take you by the hand and show you why you're wrong. And I'm like, great, that I don't want anything else. I just want to be in the family, you know? Mm, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh so I contacted him, told him my view, and I got a response within twenty four hours which said, Eric, thank you for contacting me. Um I don't know how much help I can be to you because not only do I agree with your position, but I, I did my dissertation defending it. Ooh. <laughs> oh, man. So not good. Wow. I, I forwarded that to the, you know, oh, the leadership. No. <laughs> Eric, be a gentleman. I forwarded What's that to the lead, a leadership there, and um, oh. it actually forced his hand. So he, the, lead, the pastor there said, you know what? We're going to make an adjustment. This issue now is not an essential doctrine. It's an important non-essential doctrine that we can agree to disagree on. What? Okay. Because, because wow. you know, it would have, it would have gone real south if, if uh, we had to excommunicate them too, you know. Wow. Um, yeah. So that, that there were several stories like that. Wow. Um, so, yeah, but I did, I did, uh, uh, Warner Alert, Law and Gospel. I fell in love with Luther. This is back in 2006, 2007. I just, I loved Luther's language of death and the Adam dying and and just faith and taking up confidence in Christ. And mm -hmm. uh, there was just something about Luther's writing that was captivating to me. So yes, yep. I, I actually did. But um, by the time I was sitting down with by the time I made it to uh, St. Albans, um, that's the, the, uh, yes. the Anglican Cathedral, um, I had already kind of graduated from Luther and I started to see that um, the, the Anglican divines were actually yeah. more accurate. Caroline divines? Yes, they were more accurate yeah. on this issue with James, Paul, Romans 6, 7, and 8. Um, mm -hmm. So Luther wasn't compelling anymore, even though I still I get excited when I read him because he's so captivating. But, uh, right. you, know, I, you know, at that point, I started to move more, not new perspective, because I still didn't agree with everything they were saying. But um, I just... I just didn't have a Lutheran understanding anymore by that. So, so was it the so was it the Caroline Divine? So you said you're APA. So that was you know high, higher liturgical, I think, province. Um, so the Caroline Divines did many people in those congregations know and read them. Um, yeah, uh, I know in the ACNA they weren't they weren't known at all. <laughs> people didn't read them at all. No. So what what drew you to the Caroline Divines? Like our I mean our favorite mine is Jeremy Taylor by far, but. Well, I was know, just going to uh, say Jeremy Taylor. Um, well, yeah. the APA has a reading list recommendation that I got a hold of for their seminarians. And um, they got me into Mormon. Um, and they got me into uh, reading um, some, of the, some of the divines and their understanding of faith and works and justification and um, I thought they were just more balanced. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. APA, um, they're the ones who, their reading list. All I, I just bought the whole library. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember all the books they got. They, they would recommend Catholic authors too. Mm -hmm. Because was the first thing I learned when I sat down with the rector there was, he said, oh, we love Aquinas. We love the Scholastics. We recommend every you know everything here, and they 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 talked very down about Calvin, mm -hmm. and and so I all the literature they were giving me and recommending me is what I is what I would um, consume, and so that's really what got me into reading the original Anglican, you know, uh, gloss on these on these questions. So is um, uh, is this at this point then in your journey? Um, is is this like a more of a biblical journey and meaning like what does the bible mean and then i'm consulting these kind of older authors just to bounce their ideas around or um 
is there something about this that's like squarely patristic and that's kind of like where it's all revolving around and you're judging everything by that or something, you know, like what's, what's kind of the locus of the, of the intellectual movement. It, it was really what I was seeing in the Bible. Okay. Um, I was really seeing, um, you know, the sacramentology of the new Testament, you know, baptism, the Eucharist confirmation, mm-hmm. um, church discipline, um, but then also the historical matter, because um, the first guy I listened to that really got me into the patristics on YouTube was um, Frank Schaefer's son. I don't know if you if you've, you've yeah. seen uh, Frankie Schaefer um, back in the late '90s, early 2000s. He um, wrote a number of volumes on his conversion from evangelicalism to Eastern Orthodoxy, and um, and I, le- I listened to him lecture. Um, it was a three-part lecture series that he did. And he got into the early liturgy, the early patristics, the fa- apostolic fathers. And that's what got me into it. I picked up St. Ignatius, mm-hmm. read all of his letters, started reading the Philip Schaff series. I did the same thing I did with the New Testament and Old Testament when I first came to the Lord. I just started reading all these fathers. Yeah. And... Um, that's so so is the fathers so is the fathers then that because obviously in a reformed baptist setting that's not liturgical and then right. the apa that is liturgical yeah. so <laughs> it, the fathers are what kind of pulled you into a, a liturgical mindset that's right that's right it was okay. you know it was uh you know reading uh the first the first thing that i read on this that really hit home was apostolic tradition by saint hippolytus mm-hmm. And when I when I saw that structure mm-hmm. and the way things were done on the Easter Vigil and um, the way it was conducted, I knew that um, this you know covering a good summary of Western and Egyptian practice at such an early date, this you know the liturgical way that I was seeing at St. Albans was more faithful to what I believe was what the apostles handed on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So at this yeah. point, though, you still do have, you have to have some kind of a commitment to the Reformation in, at some level, because otherwise the next logical step would be like, I'm going to become Catholic or Orthodox, but instead you're looking to Anglicanism, which that's kind of like how, you know, I saw myself is that like, well, I'm definitely not quote unquote Protestant, but I'm also not willing to say that Rome was right during the Reformation, right? So you kind of like live in this weird... I don't know, limbo. Is that That's kind right. of where you're at then? Okay. So yeah, APA so, was like so that you can hold on to the Reformation a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so by the time we became members at the APA, um, I had married um, my wife, but we did it outside in a uh, Pentecostal church because okay. I wasn't committed to any church at that time uh, before APA. I was in my research, you know, mm-hmm. Um and so we came as uh, we, we presented ourselves as husband and wife, and um, they, they accepted us. And uh, we, we started to receive communion after a while. And um, my first son was baptized there in, uh, at, at the Anglican Church. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a happy home to, I, I, I felt comfortable. Mm-hmm. Here I can incorporate history I can incorporate the early fathers, um, but then I can also incorporate the scriptures and not have to stick my neck out for the very strict um, exclusionary beliefs of Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, because I thought things like, you know, the Marian dogmas and um the eastern the eastern orthodox exclusivism Mm -hmm. um i you know when i when i first started looking into eastern orthodoxy uh i didn't get like the more americanized version where it's like oh we we know where the church is we don't know where it isn't Mm -hmm. um i I got a far more uh (laughs) you know militant version of it and um so i i felt comfortable as an anglican wanting to hold on to um, some of those principles of the Reformation, that Rome Rome had to be held accountable. There's only one way to do it, and that is to maintain apostolic succession, um, 
but also point out the fact that the Pope cannot bind us to errors, mm. you know? Yeah. And so that, that's what moved me uh, further in, in the fork of the road to, to look into Eastern Orthodoxy, because as an APA member, I was concerned about how the ecclesiology of the fathers was very different mm -hmm. than what I, because you know you, you you can i was mesmerized by the beautiful liturgy at saint albans i'm telling you it's gorgeous mm -hmm. this this place was gorgeous and the liturgy was just awesome but mm -hmm. um when you stick around long enough you're like oh hey okay we're anglicans now hon we're anglicans now um, and then you start talking to people. Oh, you're Anglican. Well, what, 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 which kind? And you're like, and you're like, mm -hmm. what, what do you mean, what kind? And like, <laughs> like, oh, when people ask you that, tell them you're part of the APA. But you can't tell me to do that without me going down exactly, <laughs> hunting down exactly what what this is now, right? Yeah. So I traced us back to a time where we didn't even have any bishops at all. Yeah. Um, the APA was just lay people. And it was, a, you know, a splinter from another schism. Sure. And um, we finally got a bishop and then replenished the leadership. But I started to realize all these other churches in the continuum and um, some of our Anglicans didn't associate with the other continuum. So I was like, this yeah. doesn't sound right. Like, if I'm going to be here till, till my grave. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to not just have a blast with the Eucharist and the, and the liturgy. I want to be able to explain what, why I am under Bishop Walter Grundorf, right. why I am here and not in another uh, continuum, you know? Right. So that, that, that it was that ecclesia, it was seeing the difference in ecclesiastical consciousness with, with the early church, and the middle all throughout the middle ages to the medieval times with with the anglican church mm -hmm. we had mm -hmm. see we had um i guess our illusion was a little bit little bit harder to break only because we were in the acna so you had that whole narrative of like oh well yeah. 70 70% of the com of the anglican right. communion agrees with us this will all be sorted out give it some time the global south's with the us the global yeah. south is with us like right. africa and everything there's in right. fact africa's sending us bishops and the whole thing and um yeah so you it was harder a little bit harder to break that illusion um i did attend like continuum churches for a while but um i was like and i loved you're right i loved that experience better like of the liturgy of authority and like they even their preaching like, their preaching was like we're in line with the church fathers like really like really you know like and so it was a like, very confident um uh you know pr i guess expression of anglicanism and then i don't know but i was i was still just thinking like but they're just a splinter of a splinter of a splinter. And then like all, and then like these, these derivative splinters don't even talk to each other. And when they do, they hate each other and they barely differ on anything. <laughs> you know, like they differ on yeah. like the dumbest stuff, you know? <laughs> and, and so then I was, it's like, okay, well then ACNA is more quote, quote unquote Catholic. But then when you're there, you're like, this is like 100% evangelical, and Pentecostal even with, yeah. with like, you know, vestments yeah. on. And so you're just like, yeah. what yeah. the heck, man? <laughs> it was like, it was like yeah. very weird. Yeah. And my, my, my evangelical ACNA church didn't even have vestments. They just wore a stole. That was it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> there were no vestments. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And, and actually it's funny because my, um, side note, my, my friend Caleb, uh, who was also in, um, he was in Anglicanism at the time too. And now he's Catholic as well. Um, he, uh, mentioned me a few days ago on the phone that that you me and dan were uh pretty pretty regularly bouncing around with each other in comments groups on like acna pages and like anglican pages on facebook and i was like <laughs> dude i have zero recollection of that so i told him i would at least wow. ask you if you have any recollection of that whatsoever or if he's telling me a lie <laughs> there, people people send me snapshots of comments that i've made <laughs> <laughs> on on things i can't sure. ever remember um yeah. so it's it's very possible <laughs> um, but i i can't and this remember. is this is when i was active on facebook 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, Dan I mean, I was on the phone picture. with a lot. I, I, I ended up talking to people on the phone a lot. Um, people, you know, uh, that you know, more of an acna leaning, mm -hmm. um, you know, North African visionaries, and or, I'm sorry, you know, South African, um, you know, just talking with people in reality. I meet them on forums, and then we we exchange numbers. But I do remember being on different websites and, sure. and uh, you those know, got, those got messy. Those got messy. So, all yeah. right. So at this yeah. point then you are, um, you are exploring orthodoxy. Now That's I have right. to ask, I'm sorry, but at this time, did you, were you already friends with, uh, Michael Lofton or when did you guys meet in that little journey? Because I know he was also looking into orthodoxy too, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we had not met yet. Um, we had not met yet. So at this point, um, you know, the APA, the, the rector there was just an amazing man. Mm. Um, and I, I didn't want to leave. I really didn't want to leave. But my second child was born. And the question was, am I going to have him baptized here at the APA? You know, and, you know, I really didn't want to say goodbye. I had a lot of good friends there. Um, it was just one of these glorious parishes you know mm -hmm. a bunch of 25 to 45 year old men uh any one of them would be carrying around saint maximus the confessor um you know it, it was just the fellowship was amazing um but at that point uh, i needed to make a decision and i had been going to orthodox services at this point too um and sitting down with my local um orthodox priest and I was really wanting to become Eastern Orthodox because I thought they were the patristic church. Right. Um, but, you know, I started l l listening to liturgy uh, on YouTube and uh, divine liturgy. And after months of listening to it on the, on the YouTube, I actually realized that what I was listening to was a Coptic Orthodox service. <laughs> nice. I was following I was following this Orthodox church every every Sunday and it, it was a so once Again, I this learned Russian about, sounds so good <laughs> <laughs> so once I learned about that I was like well what's the difference between the Eastern Orthodox and the Coptic and then I hit the books again you know and um I delay. I, I ended up being a catechumen at an Orthodox church, but I, I. By this time, the wife's probably like, "What's going on? Just, just figure it yeah, out." Right? Right? You know, my <laughs> wife was so generous. You know, um, we uh, we we spent a lot of time on our knees praying for guidance and asking the Lord to um, <clears throat> shut doors that needed to be shut. Um, but there were just so many opening up, and yeah. Uh, the Orthodox Church we were going to was just so nice. I mean, mm. the, the the first moment we went there, everybody was um, everybody was very nice to us. And um, but I knew that before I you know leave the APA now to go join an Orthodox Church, I said let me take some time to study this issue more. Mm -hmm. And people respected that. And. Mm. Um, cause I noticed what was, do what was happening is I would study Catholicism cause I knew I had to study it and I had to separate it from my upbringing, right? Because Catholicism and my upbringing was this liberal, just, it, it just, it, it was the Fans farthest thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, crayons and colored pencils, Christianity, you know? Mm. Um, and, uh, so I would study the bad things about Catholicism and, um, every time I did that, I, I would hear a ching in the piggy bank for Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. oh, this pope, you know, this that this is going on. Um, I, I learned about Saint John Paul II, and um, and so, but then I realized, Eric, you're not being fair. You know, you are just looking at the bad stuff of Catholicism and automatically scoring three pointers for the Orthodox church. Why don't you do what you need to do, right. which take mm. Eastern Orthodoxy at its best and Catholicism at its best 
and then put equal temperature underneath the frying pan. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, when I did that, I realized even though Catholicism has a skin problem, everything outside is looking really bad. The Orthodox have an internal organ issue Mm -hmm. that's even more threatening to the life of the church. And, um, and that's long story short, we, we came, we reluctantly, you know, but in, in the first church I went to was a Nova sort of church that uh, we were like, Oh, are we really leaving the Anglican church for this? <laughs> the skin's bad. The skin, <laughs> this is like leprosy. The skin's so bad. This is leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the priest that I sat down with, you know, he was, he was actually pretty good. He says, wait a minute. So you were, you were married previously. I said, yeah, because I had no idea about the, the laws on marriage, you know? And, um, he goes, and you're married to her now. And I said, yeah, he says, he said, no, that, that can't happen. You're not married. Right. So, um, when he introduced that to me, I was like, wow. So what's next? And he's like, well, you'll have to separate. <sighs> so I was, you know, I was prepared to do it. I mean, we had two children at that point, but I was prepared to do it. And, um, it really hit my wife though, really hard. So, but he said, but we need to hear more about your background. He's, and so once I told him I was baptized Catholic as a young child, six months old, he's like, well, wait a minute, you're Catholic. Oh. I said, I said, well, no, I'm not Catholic yet. We haven't even come to the Catholic church. He's like, well, no, no, no. You were baptized Catholic. <laughs> baptized I, Catholic. I said, I said, indelible, yeah. my man, indelible. <laughs> I was like, yes, I was baptized as in the Catholic Church. He's like, do you have a certificate? Do you? It's like, like I, I'm, I'm sure I could probably contact the the parishes, you know. Yeah. So we contacted that, and then he submitted that to the bishop, and the local bishop mailed me a decree of nullity saying that. Since I was Catholic, the attempt at matrimony in the Baptist Church was not successful. Was no, was no, was no. Yeah, marriage. it was not. It was not. Oh marriage. wow! So, mm. but it was hard for like six months. I mean, we. You but know. I mean, to have that level of conviction, though, to say I might have to separate from my wife. Yeah, I mean that that was tough. It was tough. We went for, we went through that for months. You yeah. hate it. You, you you were you were that unconvinced of orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the 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 Orthodox Church was. I, I think they were telling me that they would just bless the marriage. Yeah, you know, um, and I I don't know. I mean, I I just started diving more and more into the history, you know, and mm-hmm. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, um, and by that time I started seeing some squirrely things between the Orthodox parishes where I was at, yeah, you know, cause anyway, that's a story for another time. Um, so that was a breakthrough for us because now we realize we're, we're, we're still not married because technically I've never been married at that point. So we got a convalidation in the church. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that, and, and so we, we, she entered the Catholic church. I was, all I had to do was go to confession, yeah. um, which I thought was strange. I thought I was going to have to go through the whole process again. Um, yeah. So then, yeah, that was, you know, we've been in the church now, and, but I never, ever took my eyes off of Byzantium mm-hmm. and, or, or the, the Coptic Syriac church. And so I've, I've, I've devoted my entire adult life, you know, to studying these issues. And that's why. I eventually wanted it. I didn't want it to just, you know, phase out of my memory in my old age. I wanted to put down Mm -hmm. into a document what I, what I had studied over the course of 10 years, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what made, that's what led to the book. You basically did. You did like a hundred pages for each year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. So do you ever, do you ever attend now? Uh, So how long have you been, have you been back in, uh, so we entered, so we both, we, we both, ent- so I came back through <clears throat> confession in two, I think at the end of 2012, and then oh, okay. um, we were convalidated in the beginning of 2013. And okay. so your wife, and do, do you, do you, go ahead, Dan. 
There's do, you, do you attend uh, Do you attend Byzantine Catholic churches at all, or or Roman so, churches? So, uh, me being the uh, you know researcher I am, I I I found a, a Byzantine Catholic church immediately, and I befriended the priest there, and so I actually do visit there every now and then. But no, I. I didn't become Byzantine Catholic. I just, you know, what ended up happening was um, we could not take the Novus Ordo disaster in our city. I was one of those guys who says, you know what, uh, hun, we are not going to go church hopping. We are going to go to the nearest altar to our house mm -hmm. and I'm putting my foot down. I'm kidding. I'm. I, she was a great, she was in agreement with me too. <laughs> You know, I said we would go to the we will go to the closest altar where the king is dining with his people. I will not drive past it. That's where we're going. And we went there and we heard universalism. Then we said, okay, we can't do that because that's an exception. <laughs> we went to the next one and saw the next thing and went to the next one. So it was getting so terrible that I was really starting to pick up the books again on orthodoxy. I really was. Mm um until i passed by a church that said anglican ordinariat i'm like what is that i never even heard of that i did a lot of research on what on the anglicans i said i've never seen this before and then that's when i found out about what pope benedict this what happened with pope benedict the 16th and the anglican ordinariat it's more so, pontifical yeah so we or no we, it's the, no it's not yeah not 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 uh some more Anglican Orum co uh, I, I don't even Sidibus. remember the time. Yeah, I don't know. Anglican Orum yeah, yeah. There we go. Right. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, I did read it, but it was years ago. So I went inside and I heard a Catholic priest for the first time in my life preaching the gospel. Right. <laughs> Refreshing. And yeah. And, and I was like, maybe they're like on the verge of schism or something. Let me talk to this guy. You know, I ended up making an appointment with him and I, we talked for hours mm. and he was just telling me about everything and, and why they're doing what they're doing. And so that's, we've been there since then. Wow. So. Wow. I did not know you're ordinary yet. Yeah. That's awesome. That's fantastic. So, um, when then, um, so I got a couple of questions. So three questions. So we'll start with your wife. Uh, first, I, I do want to understand, like, how did you bring your like wife along on that journey? I know you said you were praying together and stuff, but like intellectually, was she like as much stimulated as you were? Or was she more like trusting where you're at? That's my first question. Second question is when the heck did you start writing the books? And then third question is when did you start <laughs> doing the reason and theology stuff? So I guess one, two, three, yeah, shoot. Yeah. All good questions. So when I first <laughs> met her, um, she was a Pentecostal. She was a worship worship uh, and praise leader at a Pentecostal church. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't meet her in church. I met her out of church. Um, and but you so can never understand a thing she was saying, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, she, she finally got me to visit her church. Um, it took a while. but mm -hmm. and, and, and when I went there... Um, they shut the lights off on me and they blew smoke all over the place. <laughs> and after they turned the lights on, there was like 50 people on their knees crying their brains out. It was like watching Hacksaw Ridge, you know, just all the soldiers <laughs> on the floor, just, you know, screaming and weeping. I thought it was like a war film, you know, and I was just standing still. I was like, I've never seen something like this before. And I, I was, in, I was shell shocked, you know. Yeah. And um, one of the worship leaders there saw me do that, and um, she actually contacted my wife Victoria and said, "I, I recognize the bad spirit in the man that you brought to church." Oh, jeez. It's like, what, what did he do? He's like, well, he wasn't. It, once the smoke came out and once the song began, he was just still, you know. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's where she was coming from. That's awesome. A uh, very tender-hearted woman. Very, uh, you know, when when I met her, I was very upfront with what I my my intentions were marriage. Um, mm. I believe in a traditional um, structure of the home, and you know, so she was very submissive. But 
um, when we went to the Anglican Church, that was no big deal for her. To go to Catholicism, that was a big deal. It wasn't until she did her own research on contraception that she finally began to come with me all the way. Oh, wow. Um, mm. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's interesting because like you're, you're, in your analogy, which I love, by the way, in the skin or there's something's wrong with the organ with the orthodox oh yeah um that the contraception issue is one of those issues where catholicism came out and took a stance mm -hmm. yeah and the depth of our thought on that issue whereas the orthodox don't have a thought on that issue you know that that's yeah. just i think one one solid concrete example of your analogy skin versus mm -hmm. something wrong inside yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you know that's that so she she eventually came along and she met catholic uh catholic woman and you know she she's the wonderful home wife she's 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 the she's the saint of our home right now i mean she's she started homeschooling all of our kids we just started having one Jeez. kid after the next and um she developed a reading curriculum for new readers for young for younger years um she i mean she's just she's a genius to me um mm. so yeah she's so helpful and um you know god knew exactly who i needed wow. um so that's the first question second question i started writing i started writing the book on the papacy through notes mm -hmm. you know i just started writing notes all the time and collecting them and i started writing a book a book in 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 microsoft office maybe like 10 times but got to like page 100 or page 50 and just gave it up mm. until I said, no, Eric, you need to do this. And like, you need to do it and then not stop. And that was around 2018. Um, and I wrote a thousand page manuscript. Um, and um, I got, it was right around the time that I met, well, I met Michael Lofton in like 2014. And we started being friends then, um, but we started reasoning theology in 2019 or 2018. I can't remember which one. And it was right around that time that I submitted the manuscript. And uh, it was through people who were watching me on Reason and Theology that got me grandfathered into St. Paul Center, which is run by Scott Hahn um, oh, wow. up in Illinois. Okay. And... Um, yeah, so that was that's when I submitted that manuscript, and once I found out it was going to be, it might even be like five years before it came out. I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" <laughs> <laughs> when when I when I found that out, because it was a thousand page document, right. you know, it's like yeah. that's not easy to publish and sell. Right. Um, I'm like, well, you know, you guys do what you want with it, I guess. You know, get back to me whenever you want. And then in the meantime, <laughs> I wrote, uh, they were great people. They were great, great people. But I didn't know how long they were going to take because they were going to, they were submitting it to blind peer review first to see if I knew what I was talking about, you know? Yeah. And um, so in the meantime, I wrote a book on the filioque way, justification, Melchizedek and the Last Supper and rebaptism in the church fathers and i published all those self-published right um because i wanted more conversations on these subjects i didn't want to have to wait you know for each one 100 yeah and uh my my goal was to get into conversations i wanted my interaction on facebook on my website on rnt to be like the old day the old halls of academia when people got together and debated and dialogued over and, and trying to chase down the truth. Right. Well, know? the new academia, right? Because like I, I look at all of us in this, in, we're all podcasters, we're all doing our thing. And and Steve and I always talk about this, how like you know we were in academia, and that whole world is so closed off. Yeah. And a lot of times, just speaking in echo chambers to themselves, right. whereas like these new platforms, you know, YouTube and all of this, has allowed independent scholars like yourself to actually have a voice because you can do scholarship too. It doesn't just have to happen in the ivory tower. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and there's that building of like academic orthodoxies and, and that gets annoying. Like there's these, there's these orthodoxies that you have to kind of play along with as you're writing and doing your research so that you don't get blacklisted. Right. So you have to sort of say like, you know, 
you have to concede from the get-go that like monopiscopacy was this kind of power struggle development in the early church kind of thing. You know, you have to concede that and then go on and, and say what you really yeah. want to say. So there's all these like yeah. you have to nod your head towards all these stupid things before you, you know, before you get to what you actually want to argue. And I think that these platforms are really refreshing in that sense because – like even when I was like in academia and stuff, like I, I same thing. I, I would be like, well, I actually don't think so. Like I actually think monopiscopacy is like really early. In fact, it, it just might be that the early churches were organized along two parallel structures, and that's okay. In fact, it could be two, three, four, or five different parallel structures, and that's okay, right? And it wasn't like this. Marxist dialectic of power struggle that made, you know, right. monopiscopacy rise to the top, you know, so it, it, it was just, you know, it, it, it was annoying. So that's why like the first 500 year series that we've been doing stuff is kind of refreshing in that sense. I know you probably feel the same way where you're like, ugh, yeah. I could just, I could just speak freely, you know, and, and quite yeah. frankly, the academics, you know, who, you know, probably look down on what things that we're doing or something, you know, but, you know, they're talking about 30 students at a time. And we're, we're sharing this information, you know, with thousands of people <laughs> at a time. So it's right. like, you know, I don't know. I, I really like what's going on in Catholicism today. And you've been a huge part of that, huge part of that. Oh, like you're wow. it, and all these new people now are coming. And even like, you know, Larry Chap is doing stuff like on, on YouTube, like all these just great, great channels. And it's just very rich right now. I feel like and you look on like the Orthodox side of things and you look on like the Anglican side of things like in, in this space, and you're kind of like we're killing it. I mean, I mean, Catholicism is killing it. And it's really ironic because we're in the middle of probably one of the most difficult times to do this. And you probably know what I'm, what I'm hinting at. So that's my next question. Um, <laughs> coming into, <laughs> coming into Catholicism, uh, under the era of uh, the Francis pontificate. Um, I think it's pretty interesting that, a lot of us came in under, under, under this era because most of us, of course, are probably not happy with some of the things that are going on. Um, so you yourself, um, when did the Francis question kind of really hit you, you know, where it was like, okay, something's not quite right in Rome today, you know, cause I think it took everybody at different speeds, you know, and some people still haven't even come around to realize it for some reason. Um, but yeah, what, what was your time? Well, I mean, it was the winter, right? He he came into office what, like September, October? I oh shoot! Okay, well, you were you're pretty early then. <laughs> yeah, it was that winter where I was like, "There's something wrong here." Mm. You know, he opened so like up 2013, the, right? Yeah, it was 2013. I had already known about some of the issues, like, um, like I told you, I was studying to, I wanted to become Orthodox, so. I was studying Vatican II and all the various narratives about, you know, John the Twenty Third, Paul the Six, and all that. Yeah. Um, but I had, you know, I kind of had a little bit of wisdom to be weary of some of the spectacular commentaries from, like, you know, some of the more trad, you know, rad trad circles. Um, but I knew Francis was a problem. And at first, I was like, "This guy's, this guy's a heretic." Like that—that's how I was at first. Mm -hmm. But then I started to see that um, you'd get like these guys coming out with defenses for Pope Francis. And I'm not the kind of guy to just turn away what you what you have to say. I will read what you have to say if if you want to oppose what I'm saying. I will read it. And I started to notice something that where where the people who were having problems with what Pope Francis was saying and doing, they had a very they had very good reasons to be frustrated, very good reasons to be upset. Mm -hmm. But if you read the high IQ left from center defenders, they also had a point. Mm -hmm. And so what I came to realize is that uh, a guy like Francis doesn't want to change overtly any church teaching. Right. What he wants to do is he wants to reaffirm church teaching and say, you know, look, uh, just we're not, you know, check Mark Denzinger, check Mark. Uh, Ludwig Ott, we're not, you know, we're not changing any beliefs. But when we consider 
the elastic flexibility of the human psyche, mm -hmm. conscience, and very difficult, complex circumstances. There, there is room to maneuver things, maintain the letter of doctrine, but maneuver things okay. so that, that we can maintain the letter of dogma, but also entertain things that we've never before conceived of as possible, right. mm -hmm. but is now possible through articulated I'm trying to find the right word. I, 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 well, he he has right. an umbrella word, right? Pastoral. I mean, he found an umbrella word for all that he does. Yeah. yeah. And it's pastoral. That's right. That's right. It's, well, it's pastoral. Yeah. Well, like, so at the time, um, there was, you know, like Taylor Marshall and, and a few others too. Um, but I, actually, it's funny because one of the main reasons why Dan and I even started doing anything um, was that I, I was listening to – a podcast from Taylor Marshall because people had like recommended it and stuff. And while, you know, like there's things about Taylor Marshall that are obviously charming, you know, there's, you know, there, he is a, um, there is something about him that, that draws you back to listen to what he has to say, you yeah. know, cause he just has that charismatic, uh, ability to do that. But when, when you're listening to that, I was, I, what I was struck by, especially being like someone who was raised Catholic, it was the first time that I heard somebody who was a devout Catholic talk in such a way about the Pope. And it was, it, it struck me like culture. I was like, I don't think you're supposed to even even if right you're not happy about something the Pope did. I just I've never heard a Catholic break like that, you know, and and talk this way about the Pope. Um, and so I was like talking to Dan, and I was like I was like a lot of people are listening to this kind of like stuff, you know, and it's mixed in with like good things, benign things, right? Just about like church doctrine, things that anybody could agree with. But then there's this, there's the other episodes where you're like, holy cow, I cannot believe you just said that on air. And he's like not going to get in trouble or, like, you know, and, and so I was me and Dan were like, man, I just feel like Catholics need to like take a step back, take a deep breath. And let's just like let's talk about how like the good things about the faith and, and these sorts of things. So we kind of started along that line. But then we also that's how we got to like the first 500 years stuff is like, let's go back to the roots and just talk from this this posture. But at the time there was Taylor Marshall. And who were the people in your mind that were kind of like center and a little center left? you know, at that time. Yeah. I, li so I, uh, so when I was first, I, I was, I got into the forums at Catholic answers mm, and, okay. um, I tried listening to Jimmy Aiken. I tried listening to, uh, Patrick Coffin, basically like the Catholic answers, YouTube show. Uh -huh. And, um, they, I mean, with all due respect, you know, I know Jimmy Aiken's a very smart man, and uh, but I, it, I, I stopped listening to him way back then. Never put him on again, um, and I started to listen to more of the uh, traditional side. At the time, it was um, John Veneri. I don't know if you remember him. He passed away, but he was part of uh, a. Um, I think he was part of like Catholic Family News. Oh, huh, okay. Yeah, and uh, I think like Matt Gaspers and John Henry Weston. Mm. It was kind of in that circle. Okay. You know? I started mm. listening to them, and I saw them as like at least they had common sense that something was wrong here. Mm. Like when I remember in Pope Francis, it was 2014. He said out loud on record. So this wasn't anything like you could twist or it was out loud on record. He said that back in Argentina, um, he, he, he would, he realized that a lot of people don't get married. They, they just, they just start to live together. And he said that some of these people have the grace of marriage, you know, and I was like, did he just say that? There's no way he said that, you know? <laughs> And he, sure enough, it was on record for various websites. And, um, and so, you know, he, John Henry Weston was on that, you know, talking about that. And, uh, I can't remember there was, some, there was some other ones, but I, I started to grow weary of it because I'm like, okay. Um, so the Pope is basically a formal heretic and now, 
you know, I was looking forward to the correction from Cardinal Burke. That was that's right. Cardinal Burke came out and talked about a correction or something like that to a Morris Letizia. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is this is around the time Lofton and I were really close friends and you guys wouldn't recognize uh Lofton <laughs> then from today. That's what I hear. Um, <laughs> yeah. He was just um you know, he, he, he was uh he was a straight shooter. I mean he was a straight shooter. And mm-hmm. so he, he and I were like, okay, something's going to have to happen here. But eventually we're like, well, it, does this mean the papacy is like right. a source of, a source of uh, destruction? I mean, what, what, what we got to step back here and go to the drawing board because um, if that's the case, then uh, we should just stop being girls here and just be men and realize, hey, <laughs> this is over with. Like, this right. is over with. Like, stop. <laughs> yeah. Um. But and and that's when I started to realize that um, it's it's worse than it than it is, but it's not as bad as we're making it out to be. That right. sounds like a contradiction. So I realized that there wasn't any over changing of teaching, but there is this exploration mm-hmm. of pastoral options that does call into question it undermines it yeah it undermines yeah. the doctrine sure and, and 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 so i i started to realize that these guys even all the way up to the chair of peter they as much it, it doesn't matter if they're if they're riding on their horses trying to cross the letter of dogma something is stopping them and they're a slave to it yeah. They can't, you know, maybe they don't like it, but they have to abide by that line. Yeah. And it makes great. Them, it mm-hmm. makes them look um forgive me for saying this, but it makes it look so silly to come out and say, "No, we aren't changing the doctrine on marriage and human sexuality, but we've got this exploration we're doing about a pastoral option to bless same-sex." Right. Uh persons you know in the context of their gay togetherness you know right, right. Mm-hmm. it's like wait a minute it, something just doesn't sound right there you know yeah it's almost That's, like so if it's you almost say like, that the gentiles like it's are proving included, it. but then i'm not going to eat with them <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but but it's um it's like uh yeah i see what you're saying where it's almost proving that right. catholicism is actually working the magisterium is yeah. working in that they they know they can't they can only go so far and frankly because it is pastoral it it'll it could change back yeah we could make somebody will come along and change right but my my only the only thing i hate about that right is that the church then can become this political back and forth pastoral this pope's this kind of guy okay that pope's that kind of guy kind of thing whereas we you know we grew up not really caring much about what the pope said Right. right, you're just live your Catholic life, and I think that's how I how Francis Francis kind of escaped my notice for the first few years, is that oh he's the Pope and he he does his thing and we do our thing here, um, but I think um, the first time I was like okay, wait a minute, what's going on here is when he when he changed uh, on the death penalty I think when he oh, decided yeah. by his own hand to go into the catechism and yeah. change that. That to me, that woke that kind of that was my waking moment. I think. Yeah, that one's a, that one's um, you know I, I I don't have the Rubik's cube solved on that one. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. we could we could all do our whole thing of like, well, you know, it's practically in our, an invisible. And, That's yeah, not the same in as our, inherently in our moral situation and, and all that. <laughs> but um, it, it it's tough to sustain that, and um, but you know this is why I tell people and this. This frustrates a lot of my Catholic friends too. I get messages all the time um, sure. chastising me for not being um, more consistent. Is um, if if I'm wrong about something, you know, I want to know about it. You know, so I will. Uh, I'll be open to you know speaking to people who want to challenge my beliefs, um, and. Uh, sometimes I write what I think. Maybe I go too far sometimes, 
but I, I write what I think because I want to afford the opportunity for me to be corrected if I need to be corrected. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, so to that point on the, the, with the book on the papacy, you said it was a thousand page manuscript. I think it ended up at 700 something. Um, where was there, are there still, still things you wish you got to or wish or went unsaid or are there, are there things that you wish were in there or things you didn't want in there? Um, it, or is that like, this is my, this is my word on the papacy. You, you're satisfied completely. Yeah. So, um, so we had to sh trim some fat and ended up being a lot of fat, but the, 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 you know, I had a whole appendix on Pope Vigilius, um, which I thought is a subject matter that has been buried, uh, for, for far too long. And uh, I think it's a, it's a case study that, that can o potentially open the way to help explain um, contemporary our contemporary situation, mm. um, and and so that 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 whole thing had to be taken out, and um, also on epistemological considerations, um, you know the way that Catholics present the whole concept of you know the need for an external, visible, objective criteria of authority, and if you don't have that, then you basically don't know anything. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to bring in some of the Eastern Orthodox thinkers and, um, I, I surveyed a lot of like the Alexei Komiakovian ideas from German idealism. It kind of spread into other Eastern Orthodox writers in the uh, 19th and 20th century. Um, and I, I, you know, I found some of it compelling. Mm. I did, you know, mm. I found some of it compelling. And, uh, but uh, nonetheless, in my chapter on the, on epistemology, I give both sides and I say why both sides need each other. You know, one of those things, it's not the most satisfying thing, but, um, you know, so that was taken out. I guess my views on Pope Honorius have developed a little bit since the book. Um, okay. I, I, I'm not. Uh, the book itself was uh, praised by Dr. Robert Fastici. Um, you know, he's one of those guys today that's being looked at as a, you know, big defender of Pope Francis, the papacy, the indefectibility mm. of the Pope. Um, if I was going to rewrite the book today, um, I would say that um, there, there exists some things in the Roman archives all the way to this day that would help us understand perhaps, um, you know, at least to understand the capacity of what's going on right now. If we could just revisit this issue, you know, on uh, papal failure. Yeah, that's great. I, it, it would actually be great um, to to explore just that issue, like you said, like just papal failure. Yeah, I'm writing and a book on Honorius right now. Fantastic. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I'm, I'm trying. Can you Thank see what you. I'm trying to do here, Eric? I'm Thank trying to push you. you. Um, no, I, I, I love that because I, I, same instincts here too. Or you know, you're, I mean, just on the pages of Scripture, you don't even have to go to the subsequent history. Um, you know, I know that it's ad nauseum. People have brought up, oh, hey, Paul corrected Peter at Antioch. You know, it's like yeah. you know, everybody says it so that they can just say all kinds of terrible things about Pope Francis. You know, it's like a great justification for them. But, however, there is a point there that that Paul did correct Peter, you know, to his face yeah. in Antioch. And, and why, though? It's really the question of why. And it's because what he was doing and what he was recommending people among him do – was undermining Peter's own doctrine, right? Like every, right. Like what Peter taught was being undermined. And the same thing, you have this exact situation where Pope Francis's, you know, own magisterium in 2021 said one thing about this issue, right? That was that was Pope Francis's teaching. But yeah. now uh, Fernandez comes in there after having all kinds of sexual fantasies and writing about them as theology. Now he comes in and then he puts the, you know, puts this forward and gets signed off on and it's like the practice that you are recommending right now totally undermines Pope Francis's own teaching in 2021 as promulgated. 
So it's like, this is the time then where we do need to hear Paul. Like that's, see, so if anybody adopted a view of the papacy at some point in their life that didn't allow for Paul to correct Peter at any time, you went wrong somewhere. Like you adopted a view of the papacy that, that the church herself does not adopt, you know? Very good point. That was I, that was that was my take anyway, yeah. but yeah I, I well that'll that'll be the inter, that'll be the introduction to the book on Honorius. <laughs> right yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's one last thing. It's going to be about an hour and a half here, so um, we'll yeah. yeah. His camera went out, but I think you're still there, right, Eric? Can you hear me still? Yeah, I can still hear you. Oh yeah, can yeah. I think my camera yeah. died on me. Yeah. I'm just, oh, okay. No worries. We can still hear we can still hear your lovely voice. So so um yeah. there's one last thing that uh we didn't want to get to. We had some um some you know listener message uh come in and he specifically mentioned you and I, I told him that hey well we're gonna have Eric on um fairly soon and I gave I gave, you know, our own answer to his question, but I wanted to hear kind of what your thoughts would be. Um so I Dan, do you wanna read the, the message that he sent to us? Oh sure. Sure, sure. Okay, big fan of your podcast YouTube channel. I've been surveying the evidence for a while now, and it's just so difficult to know whether to stay Protestant, Reformed, become Anglican, or become Catholic. It's difficult since people that, I, that know way more than me on both Protestant side, my friend at Westminster Seminary, uh, and the Catholic side, um, you guys and Eric Ybarra, among others, uh, who know their stuff and still disagree, I just don't know how to make the right decision. I'm in agreement with you that as a whole, Reformed Protestantism seems to be much less in accord with historical Christianity. But then again, Protestant denominations don't claim to be infallible. I've been reading, when I have time, Newman's essay on development. It has helped, but I am, no, I am by no means ready to say, as he did in his Apologia later in life, that the Roman Church is the oracle of God. So any words of encouragement for the feller with uh, with where he's at? Because I think we've all sort of been in that in that state. Um, any words of advice for for him? Yeah, uh, is my audio still coming through? Yeah, yeah, we got you. All yeah. right, good. Yeah, I do apologize. Uh, I I didn't realize that it would it would die with <laughs> within uh, an hour and a half. So, but as long as my audio is coming through, I'm I'm happy. Um, so yeah, yeah, this is a great. Um, you know, question and, um, t you know, to the questioner, I, I know exactly where you're at and I know how it feels and I know how it feels to watch different people and see their respective confidence. Um, as if, you know, you, 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 you turn on to Catholic answers and they make it out like it's a no brainer, you know? <laughs> um, and then, you know, you, uh, you find some somebody more sophisticated who's not a Catholic and, and they are compelling to, I know what it's like. I've been there. And uh, so what I would say is, um, you know, it, it's good. It's good to kind of get a, a think outside the box here for a little bit, because, um, you know, and I, I think about Ga Dr. Gavin Orland, because, you know, he he's a guy who who. Um, I think gives a very strong objection to Catholicism, apostolic succession, and all these things. Um, and an answer to him, I think, would also help you. So one of the things I've told Orlin in the past, and I still hold it to this day, is um, that his understanding of the Christian uh, church is not coherent with the Old and New Testament's understanding of the church. And here's why. Uh, the Old Testament was preparing the way for the kingdom of Christ, the Messiah, right? We had all those prophecies about the failures of Israel, about the failures of the covenant, and about one day God's going to send David's son to be the shepherd, to be the teacher, to be the king, right? To be the savior. Well, he came. We all believe him. He's Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and he taught that the kingdom of God came with his person and in a very special way. And he took 12 men and pre pre prepared them. 
and he gave them the keys of the kingdom, which means that they were going to be doing the work of the kingdom when he left. And that's what we see. John 17, the high priestly prayer, he prepares to leave. And then he prepares to stay at the same time through the Holy Spirit. Um, and he gives the church the authority and says he's going to lead the church into all truth. And that the church would, he would carry the government of the, of the church on his shoulders. Um, that's what Isaiah said. And that's exactly what he said when he said, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the, and, uh, even unto the end of the age. And so he would lead the church into all truth. He will be with the church until the end of the age. He who hears you, hears me. So what that means is that the kingdom of God came with the church at least in this side of in this side of the earthly stage of the, the of the kingdom of christ is the church and christ it's christ's own responsibility i know this sounds a little you know i speak as a man it's christ's own responsibility to make sure that the mission that the father gave him to to keep everyone that was given to him right john 5 john 6 is is fulfilled and if we take the imagery um the nuptial imagery of paul where he says christ insofar as he nurtures his himself with his divinity and and the life of grace he nurtures the mystical body and so for the first first 1500 years of Christ, of christianity um we we're not supposed to be looking at the unfaithfulness of the group of 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 christ towards his bride we have to look at history and say no he's been taking care of his bride mm -hmm. um what we expect to see is a heavenly christ filling the earthly christ and uh, here I'm using the imagery of Augustine, Saint Augustine. the total Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saint Augustine. Christ the head, Christ the body, heaven and earth. Um, he, insofar as he has life in himself, he gives life to the mystical body. And one of the things that's not compatible with that is a, a wholesale departure from the truth. And according to De Gavin Orland, um, the church has departed from the truth into idolatry, into serious soteriological errors. And yet he wants to say that the church is still indefectible regardless. But that's not consistent. That's not a coherent view. Um, so go back and, you know, go back into the, into the historical sources and look at it from the lens of, okay, where Christianity is in a consensus base. You don't even have to go to like the particulars, like about the papacy and about, um, you know, iconography and things like this. Just look at what was a consensus over the first thousand years. And you know that Christ was not nurturing his body with Protestant Reformed Christianity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He wasn't. He he was nurturing his wife with something that looks like what the apostolic churches do and yeah. believe. So that should at least yeah. get you off the it should take take the five hundred pounds off your shoulders about Protestantism. That, mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now. Um that's gonna bring you to the fork between Byzantium, uh Egypt, you know, the other Oriental churches and Rome. And, uh, and, and for that, I don't have the greatest, um, and the, and, you know, I don't have the greatest of clarity for you. Um, but what I could tell you is that, um, if, uh, if you go back and research, you know, the, the councils, just use what the Orthodox look to as the, the, the unquestionable authoritative sources, um, and you will find something that is closer to the Catholic view on primacy. 
and you will also see that the filioque was accepted in the in the in the west and so at the very least i think catholicism is safe at the very least now that that won't that won't qualify you to become a catholic because you can't just come to the conviction that catholicism is safe you have to come to the conviction that it's true mm -hmm. and all of its claims are true um and i would afford yourself some time you know mm -hmm. make this more a matter of uh uh a spiritual journey than an intellectual one um an intellectual journey can change in one evening trust me yeah you get the right guy you get the right guy on a saturday night he will change you <laughs> yeah yeah um, no I'm, I'm glad you say that though that that last part especially because um it, one of the things that I, I don't know if it was to him specifically or another person who wrote in, but it's similar idea that like you get to a point where you get, you reach intellectual exhaustion where you, um, I could, I could believe the Orthodox position on this. I could believe the Catholic position on this. You know, you're like, I see both. And, but this is the beautiful thing is that this is what, this is what kind of like modern rationalism has done to us is that they, right. they've, turned christianity into something where like if i don't grasp this rationally and agree with it rationally like right now my conscience is pricking me and i can't give assent but the catholic right. idea is so different because you what, what you find when you when you come to catholicism is that any question marks that you that you still had like that you're like i i, I don't know enough about that right like the catholic church does though and so then yeah. you can you can give your assent you can give yourself over to her because you've already come to realize she is your mother she is christ's bride end of story full stop so you, you can trust her right so like right. Mm -hmm. that's the and that's why sometimes i even forget some of the questions i was wrestling with even though i was up at night sweating and crying and all that stuff trying to figure out what to do <laughs> but but no you, you you do you eventually come to a point where you feel like all of that is past and I can now give myself to her and, and submit myself to her. And I, and I found this, um, this was very acute in, in a recent discussion that Gavin Orland, had, you brought him up, Gavin Orland had with um, Father Stephen DeYoung, I just watched this one. And there was a point at which, like, Gavin was like, well, well, I'm not willing to say yes to that because in my conscience, I, I can't accept that. Or like, he can't, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and, and you're like, well, but, <laughs> but then who's the authority here? Right. right. Like, like it, it really is like just your mind, like your mind is the authority. And until somebody satisfies your mind, you will not give it over. But to me, I mean, you look at the pages of scripture and you just see the apostles yielding to Christ all the way through. <laughs> like, right. like every time that Christ is saying, is that, is that a hard saying for you? You're going to leave me or you're going to stay with me? And they're like, well, exactly. who, well, who else are we supposed to go to? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. But to them, it was a very hard saying. Who can accept it? Because we sure as heck can't, Christ. But he's saying, well, you That's have right. to. Well, you have to. That's right. and, I, and, I, and I don't know if any of us came into the church fully convinced of, right? We all had things right. that were like, I'm not convinced by that, or I don't know about that. But I'm there. I'm at the fork, like you said, Eric. I'm at the, it brings you to the fork in the road, right, at least. And yeah. you're there. And the apostolic churches are there to help you along. That's right. And to give yourself over to that uh, what would, in my opinion, be the best uh, approach at that point. Right? That's right. And uh, I think that the way to contrast, like the Orland route, who I have I have enormous respect for. He's a friend of mine. Oh yeah. But the the Orland route is is the archaeological route. It's 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 the museum route. It's um, a very limited. You know what can we reproduce from the ground right hmm. there's not much but but the people who lived there if they could talk to you from back thousands of years ago um that would certainly tell you you know what happened in the past <laughs> but if you if you silence if obviously you can't speak to these people and you go by what they left in the dirt there's only so much you can reproduce yeah and exactly. i think mm -hmm. protestantism is the archaeological route which keeps you blind from so much, you know? Yes. And um, I think, you know, Catholicism is going by the route of, hey, this hospital has been making saints for 2,000 years. Just trust the, just it's the trust living, it's the living on. route. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Exactly. It's, the, it's the living one. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Awesome. Well, hey, we've been at it for an hour and 
and 45 minutes or so. Um, so I, I had a blast. That, yeah. I could, I, I mean, we could keep talking <laughs> for like, you know, 10 hours, I'm sure, or we can even make 800 pages out of this one. Um, but I just, <laughs> just want to say, uh, Eric, it's, it's really, really great to have you on. Definitely not the last time we'd love to have you on again. Um, yeah, and absolutely. if you want to right now, give a plug, give a plug for anything that you're doing right now. Um, you know, Patreon or whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a Patreon. I've, I've given my three courses, which actually coincides with uh, your, your friend's message because um, I have a course that I've already done on justification. Um, that's on Patreon. Uh, the first lecture is free. So it kind of gets to give somebody uh, the idea of what's being said. Um, and then I also have a course on Melchizedek in the Last Supper, which I know that that comes as strange to certain, you know, for, for some people like, what does Melchizedek have to do with this? <laughs> but I draw a straight line between Melchizedek and transubstantiation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that helps uh, for people to understand that the Bible itself, and not just John 6 and 1 Corinthians 11, uh, teaches transubstantiation. Uh, and then um, I just started my course on the papacy, going through my book, and the first uh, cor- the first talk is free. I just put it up on uh, YouTube, and so if anybody wants to come, kind of get an idea of what, how I teach and what I say, and and uh, if they feel like they're interested, they could you know come uh, come and stay with me as I get further into it. Great. Um, well, yeah, I mean, awesome. all your all your material is fantastic. I mean, hey, let Thank Eric you. Ybarra be the right guy in the right night for you. Uh, make sure you get, <laughs> you get into one of his courses on Patreon. Um, but, yeah, thanks for coming on. And like I said, it won't be the last time. And thank you to everybody for listening tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.